Good morning, good morning, good morning. Oh, which way should I go? Which way should I go? Windy way. My steering wheel's going the windy way, so I'll go, I'll, I'm going to follow my steering wheel. Oh. Anyway, how are you? It's another lovely day in paradise. We've got to. Uh, Got a few exciting things going on. My computer works packing up, and so uh, no, no uh, CCTV today. Sorry, I'm in the other car that doesn't have the camera. But um, I wanted to record this today because, well, first of all, I didn't expect to be in this car. I'm in this car because I'm meeting someone, and my old car's too crappy to meet them in. A bit more about that later, and then. Uh, I wanted to record this today because uh, I wanted to talk about things while they're sort of contemporaneous and fresh. And something ha happened yesterday which I want to talk about. But uh, anyway, so uh, my screen, the uh, computer screen at work keeps going black. Which is the worst kind of bloody computer problem because you can't. You know, computers, not they're still not at the point where they can announce what fault they've got if they've got a fault. The worst kind of fault is where you turn the computer on and the light, blue light, comes on the front of the computer box and the screens just go, stay black. You get no bloody clue at all as to what that might be. And if you want to troubleshoot it, you have to get down on the floor, get the screws out of the box, start disconnecting hardware, start swapping RAM modules, you know, just trying to identify what sort of uh, hardware fault it might be. And funnily enough, uh, when I got the side off the computer and uh, put it on its side, and uh, it booted up okay, and I've just left it like that on its side on the basis that if it wants to work on it, if it wants to have a lie down, then fine. Who am I to criticise? So, uh, but that supports the idea that it's some sort of. Uh, faulty electrical connection you know in the RAM or the uh, graphics card or something so I might when I get a minute take it apart and just try and blow, blow a bit of um, air on it and try and de-dust it but uh, I've, uh, I've ordered a nice computer but um, it's going to take uh, over a month to arrive because we've got a semiconductor uh, chip shortage at the moment and so uh, and also um, everybody wants to get their hand on the latest and greatest graphics card which is the 3080 uh, to do crypto mining so <coughs> these cards have got so fast now I don't understand why the I mean there's a requirement to make uh, graphics fast because they want to portray pictures in real time in 3D uh, do, all the, do all the maths on the 3D actually people don't realise that the uh, picture that they see on their computer screen is actually in 3D um, uh, it's actually just reduced to 2D to, to display it on the screen but it's all worked out as if it was 3D and uh, so, so they've got a fantastically clever and uh, harness the power of parallel processing and splitting jobs up into lots of parts so that they can all be worked on simultaneously um, but for some reason completely failed to ever do that with the central processing unit which is the one that uh, sort of still doing maths obviously but just does more of the sort of the actual job and none of the display so someone perhaps someone can explain that to me I don't know why anyway I diverge from the thrust so um, so after every year the uh, Zoological Society of London who owns uh, Regent's Park Zoo and uh, Whipsnade, Whipsnade Zoo does a survey of all the seals in the Thames estuary and uh, Uh, it used to be done by a friend of mine called Andy. He's a, we're both pilots, and uh, 
he's sort of in his 70s now and he's sold his airfield and he's uh, sold his well he never had a share in a plane he used to be able to borrow a plane but he didn't uh, he hasn't got access to it anymore that plane failed its MOT and got flown off for repair or whatever and um, so he said to me do you fancy doing it you know it just involves uh, volunteering uh, some time to uh, fly a, a couple of guys or girls around from the Regent's Park Zoo uh, to photograph the seals and they photograph all the seals and then they uh, then go back and uh, count them so it's not like you have to fly around in circles while they go sort of one two three four five six seven eight. oh wait wait wait, wait no one of them has moved uh, one two three four five oh no another one's moved so <laughs> <laughs> anyway and I think uh, I don't know what they do with the photos so, but anyway they might sell a few I don't know I'm not involved in any of that but I'm just volunteering my time really and the use of the aircraft um, they're contributing towards the costs which is fine it's not a commercial flight really well it's not a commercial flight at all really it's um I'm not receiving any remuneration for the flying or the uh, or they're not hiring the plane or anything and uh, I don't have a, any uh, financial interest in any money they might make out of the photos or out of selling the survey or anything so it's just I'm just volunteering but uh, uh, they will be uh, contributing towards the uh, running costs so that's quite nice so I get to fly around quite a few hours uh, with the bulk of the running costs being paid by someone else so that's what I get out of it. Although obviously it does um, involve quite a loss of income because, um, for example, I'm going to meet the woman this afternoon who wants to come down to the airfield and have a look at the plane and um, and uh, so I'm having to take an afternoon off of work, you know. And I think one of the weeks that they want to do the flying is one of my weeks of the summer holiday. Not that I'm going anywhere. But uh, that'll be a week, uh, well, they'll give me something to do the week I'm off anyway. And hopefully the weather will be a bit nicer. It's been a bit crap, the weather up to now. But still, it's looking a bit nicer today. So anyway, what, why, why am I so, uh, why am I bursting to do a podcast today? Well, yesterday I got a letter from Dental Law Partnership. And uh, Dental Law Partnership uh, is a firm of solicitors, and I think with its roots in a bunch of people who were qualified solicitors and dentists, who felt that uh, you know there was a gap in the market for for a firm of solicitors that specialised in uh, uh, action against dentists because they sort of understood they understood the dentistry you know because they're all dentists as well and so they uh, I don't think it's so much as a of a crusade to uh, improve dentistry as a crusade to um, uh, improve their earnings as solicitors by virtue of their specialist dental knowledge uh, and it's not I mean it's not, so dentistry is a bit of a crap market to be honest because nothing ever goes to court and uh there are no massive awards. There were no like massive awards, um, but you can get a bit of money out of the indemnity societies if you, you know, if they just want to. It, mostly, it's like nuisance claims if they just want to make you go away, and so they'll pay you a bit of money. And then, and in the old days, what used to happen was that the um, you used to be able to claim your costs from the other side, so patient would go to dental law partnership they would sign up sign them up on a no win no fee basis and then let's say uh, the claim was for like three thousand pounds or five thousand pounds even and the and the legal fees were five thousand pounds on each side and then your indemnity uh, society said all right then you know rather than go to court and spend a hundred thousand pounds we'll just pay you the five well then what used to happen was then the the indemnity society used to have to pay the five and then they used to have to pay 
your the patient's solicitor's cost, which was five. Then obviously they've got their own cost, which were five. So they end up paying for the whole lot, which is the way the legal system works because it's um, that's how they've um, you know that's how you win. You win, then you the other side pays for everything. You lose, then uh, you pay for everything. But then that led to a tremendous amount of speculative um, claims because uh, of this fact that the indemnity societies always used to reach a compromise involving a, a payment rather than go to court. Uh, and uh, so basically what happened was that the, the solicitors' dental law partnership weren't, weren't a very good thing because basically the biggest thing that used to get awarded was they, they would both get paid for doing what they did, all they had to do was make a half reasonable case. The patient got a few quid and they got a nice living out of it. But then the rules changed and said that basically both sides had to pay their own costs. And so dental law partnerships still uh, do a conditional fee agreement. Um, but if I'm correct, and I think I am, that the, um, their costs then have to come out of the award which is really how a no win, no fee uh, arrangement is supposed to work. You know, they're supposed to go to the patient and say, look, uh, you either get nothing or you might win 10,000, say, of which we, we would charge you five, so you're five grand up. Um, and the patient says, all right then, I'd rather have five out of 10 than naught out of naught. So anyway, I got this letter, which is a, I don't, they call it a letter before action or something. Uh, just uh, because when when they're about to issue proceedings they're required to send you a letter saying that they are about to issue proceedings um, it's called the pre-action protocol or something and uh, and it wasn't the first letter I'd received about I don't know almost a year ago now it must be I, I received a letter from the dental law partnership saying could they have this patient's records in connection with suing another dentist uh, which I don't know how accurate that was. I mean, that, I don't know which other dentist they might have been suing. But I, but honestly, we, we've got nothing to hide, so we sent them the records. And um, I don't know whether that was a blatant misdirection, whether they thought that I wouldn't send them the correct records if it, I thought it was me being sued. But anyway, we sent all the stuff off. We, we, didn't, we didn't mind anyway. And then uh, a year later, of course, we get this letter saying that they, you know, they considered I'd... It's about a root treatment on an upper left six. Um, which the patient had some discomfort after, and uh, which was unfortunately was persistent, and uh, uh, but was described by the patient as two out of ten on the pain scale. And, you know, basically if I'd had a tooth saved and root treated, and really all I had was a bit of a... Uh, a minor two out of ten style pain from it then uh, providing I had the expectation that that would probably improve over time then um, you know I wouldn't I wouldn't sue the sue the dentist but you know what patients are like these days what are you gonna do but that's that is the main thrust of it I mean I've had two other complaints in my 40 years I had uh, the first complaint I had was a patient who uh, I took a wisdom tooth out of and uh, she had uh, more pain from it afterwards than she thought she should have done um, and uh, but didn't didn't contact the surgery didn't come back to see me I, I absolutely the first I heard about this wisdom tooth after the extraction was a letter from the local family practitioner with a committee saying uh, you know you're you're being summoned to a hearing to consider whether or not you uh, cause this patient a lot of pain and distress by extracting this wisdom tooth, you know, for which you were not adequately trained or qualified. And um, I lost that because um, a dentist called Ashley Lupin, who I knew, you know, was from the local dental committee, was on the committee, and he and we'd taken an OPG beforehand, and he looked at the OPG. And he stated uh, outright that it was his opinion that the wisdom tooth had been completely covered in bone. In other words, it was completely underneath the bone. 
and uh, in saying that it, it wasn't underneath the bone that I was lying to the committee and uh, had obviously it was obviously a very difficult extraction it should have been referred to an oral surgeon now I had two problems with that the first one was that I knew that what he was looking at was the external oblique ridge on the mandible which is <laughs> on OPG gets superimposed over the lower left third molar and the fact that he was misinterpreting the x-ray he was he was looking at the external oblique ridge and saying that that was bone over the, the molar which it wasn't it was bone it was bone buckled to the molar that really wasn't a problem and um, and also I knew that he was misinterpreting it because I'd seen the tooth and I knew damn well it wasn't covered with bone but my problem at the time was being quite a junior practitioner I didn't feel uh, able to challenge him on that point because he was a very senior practitioner in the area and anyway uh, in any case he was quite able to convince the committee that his viewpoint was uh, correct and that any contrary opinion I might have uh, would have been lying uh, and compounded the offence and so uh, you know I lost that one I didn't I had no chance Th thanks to the ignorance of Ashley Lupin um, and then the second one was a really weird one because uh, uh, that was when I was uh, ch uh, chief, uh, chief executive of the General Dental Practitioners Association and uh, the, one of the uh, council members, a guy called John Chope, wanted to remove me. Um, we had a big battle. He sided with um, a few of the council members. I was an actual employee of the association, so it wasn't quite as difficult to remove me as he would like. And uh, at, at the uh, at the annual dinner, we, we had quite a few phone calls uh, to the GDPA, intended for the GDC, because uh, people used to use, nobody at that point, they couldn't Google the GDC number, they had to use director inquiries, and director inquiries used to give them the first general dental number that came up, and sometimes that was us. And we used to refer them all to the uh, to the GDC but for this after dinner speech I decided it might be quite funny to make up a story about how we um, tried to dissuade the patients from uh, complaining on the grounds that uh, what they were saying was quite stupid and unreasonable and uh, Chope seized upon this to uh, try and dethrone me by um, making a case in front of the General Dental Council that I brought the profession into disrepute um, the only problem was he was chairman of the disciplinary committee of the GDC himself and so he felt that it would be seen as a conflict of interest to uh, refer it because uh, he was arrogant enough and his ego was big enough uh, for him to think that merely by virtue of him making the complaint as the chairman of the disciplinary committee that it would automatically be found to be correct and so he wanted to distance himself from any uh, any hatchet job and so he um, came up with a plan to for the chief dental officer Barry Cockroft to make the complaint um, which was which was visible because Cockroft wasn't even at the dinner <laughs> he didn't there's no way Cockroft could have known what I said you know and let alone made a first-hand complaint about it so he made um he made a complaint on behalf of this uh, and and uh, I was at a loss you know when the General Dental Council I think when they got this complaint they must have been embarrassed to have received it because they don't they're there to look after professional matters you know like matters of negligence and lack of training and stuff like that not uh, not uh, political squabbles not uh, um, political infighting and not and not complaints about jokes in bad taste at dinner parties which is what what the complaint was about so I just uh, I had to then again I had to toss a coin I had to say look if I uh, you know say that this whole thing's a charade and a farce and a, not not within the scope of the GDC and uh, but I, I made a very carefully calculated decision that uh, my best course of action will be simply to apologize for any offense that I cause um, and in which case then what could they do you know I mean what they can't strike me off because they, they they want to dispose of this complaint as much as I did and so I just uh, 
I just wrote back and I said, I'm sorry if I caused any offence. You know, it was was not intended and it won't happen again. And and the GDC sees that and said, right, fair enough, all right, you know, just make sure it doesn't happen again. <laughs> and, and that was the last anybody heard of it. But it didn't have the intended effect because I still, it didn't, you know, the general DPPA didn't uh, do anything, didn't take any action against me as chief executive as a result of it and the whole thing was a farce. So that was the second one. And then the third one arrived yesterday. And the reason why I mention it is because I'm going to, um, I'm going to do two crowns on a woman this morning. She's a lovely woman and I'm gonna to go to work and I'm gonna do my best job possible and I'm gonna try and do two really, really nice, aesthetic, good looking crowns on her two front teeth. <coughs> and that's what I've always done for 40 years. I've always gone to work in good faith, tried to do the best job I possibly can on every single job I've done, whether it's uh, polishing someone's teeth or giving them uh, plant control advice or, or doing a to implant supported bridge or whatever. And yet I'm not, I'm thinking now, you know, they just wear you out, these patients, these, these patients who complain because they get a pain, a two out of 10 pain, and decide to, um, that they're gonna sue you. They're gonna sue you. <laughs> you know, for negligence, and it's a high bar. I don't really, I'm not too worried about this because, you know, to, to get into real trouble in dentistry, it doesn't just have to have gone wrong. I mean, things can go wrong in dentistry, that's not a problem. Uh, it's you know you don't guarantee success in 100% of cases, uh, but they have to prove that you know you knew what you should have done and you deliberately or negligently didn't do it. Uh, and they, I don't think she can prove that in this case. You know we've got an X-ray that shows the root treatment's pretty damn good root treatment. But um, and we didn't disengage with her or anything. You know and we always said to her lot, if you have got a problem, then please get in touch. Blah blah blah. Uh, but I think the problem is that, as usual, she went to another dentist, and the other dentist, who's, who's a local competitor, seized upon the opportunity to say that it's the worst dentist, worst root filling he's ever seen in his entire life. Uh, and so there you go. That's what starts it all off. And I got another um, email yesterday from uh, a patient who came came to the practice before I bought it. I mean, I bought it in 2015. She came in 2012. She had an implant supported bridge. She says that she's, uh, you know, she's heard that the dentist who did the bridge has been suspended, which he has, uh, although not for the reasons that she thinks, or, or anything to do with uh, anything that might be remotely to do with the bridge. And, um, and uh, he didn't bother to turn up to the GDC because I think he's got this point, got to this point now where you just don't, it's not that you don't care, it's just that you don't, you, you say, all right, uh, you win, I give in, all right? I am not, for example, I'm not gonna do these two crowns today because there's a remote chance that you will, you know, in a year or two's time, you will be taking me to the GDC because they are one quarter of a shade incorrect in terms of the color. And you just don't wanna work. It just sucks the life out of you. It just sucks the enthusiasm out of you. I'm amazed that I've managed to keep it going for 40 years. Because many of my compatriots in my year at dental school uh, have retired after 25, 30, certainly 35 years saying, I don't know how you can carry on. I don't know why you still bother. And uh, you know, and uh, perhaps that's how it can, happens in the end. You know, we all just wake up in the morning and think, I don't know why I bother. But I still, I'm still bothering at the moment. And uh, this woman, as far as I'm concerned, I hope it comes to nothing. And if it doesn't, then, then I'm indemnified anyway. But it just it sucks the life out of you, you know. It just sucks the life and the fun. And I don't know whether they know they do this. I don't know whether these patients and these lawyers and, and the general dental council know that they're responsible for a lot of uh, very good dentists leaving the profession just because they, they suck the life out of them, you know. They just, they just don't, 
the, the ones who stay and sort of carry on are the ones that are making shit loads of money doing substandard treatment because they don't care and um, and they form the bulk of the profession and uh, and the guys who are doing it for, for reasons are, uh, decide that there aren't enough reasons to carry on anyway sorry a bit of a downer but um, and that's the way it works right I'll um, I'm off to work do some crowns talk to you later bye